early 80s was a critical moment for me at least to uh, experience the whole field of electronic music. The environment at the time was fresh and new. It, it kind of like influences or inspires to say to get involved with yourself and you know, all these other different people. You're very impressionable. So when you hear these sounds, you know, these musical approaches, it kind of stimulates your thinking to want to pursue that also. It's the whole spectrum of electronic music. Dance music, experimental, science fiction soundtracks. Uh, you know, you had different groups uh, ranging from Tangerine Dream, Jean-Michel Jarre, Kraftwerk. Just a host of other people doing this type of music. I kind of like to play around, or should I say, experiment with, with different linguistic things. So that's just, maybe that was a momentary phase to see how it works. There's, there's no plan or connection. It, it, it's only an experiment. Depends on what the data is. So if this music data fits this concept, it is applied here. If it's this one, it's applied to another name. So it all depends on what the sound turns out to be. Then it's determined on what project it's applied to. It's track dependent. Scientifically, it represents change in sound waves, the motion of a source relative to the observer, vice versa. So the name was some its meaning was simplistic and it applied perfectly to what we wanted to do at that time. You know, present simplistic ideas, but try to have some sort of sophistication with the simplicity. I think it was a very spontaneous situation. However you feel, I think at that moment, that is what is um, documented sonically. Everything in the process is usually spontaneous, most of the time. Sometimes it emerges from pre-planned concept, but a lot of times it's spontaneous. Nowadays, I try to work more in a framework of pre-planned concept, a complete theme when the music is executed according to that theme. But spontaneity is still a part of the creative process. I don't think any instrument or any era will produce magic. My philosophy is that you can take any instrument, no matter which era it came from, and if you apply it creatively, you can get a, an interesting sound. Now, granted, you have some technology that has a better sound than others, but generally speaking, there is no classic set of devices to produce a certain sound. You can use all machines from all eras to get a unique sound. I think ergonomics plays an important role. How well you can manip manipulate things and uh, how quickly you can manipulate things because the creative process, you want to be able to synchronize um, parameter changes with inspiration. You do not want any of that to be out of phase, out of sync. So when you want to get to a certain sound, you should not have to access multiple pages, multiple menus to get to a certain sound. You should be able to access it readily. Ergonomics plays an important role in the creative process. The, the producer should be able to access his, should be able to realize his ideas rather um, instantly. He shouldn't have to uh, have a delay between finding the idea he wants and applying it. Because the inspiration between, between those two times can be lap, can escape. When a person is playing a guitar, for example, they shouldn't have to like tune strings while they're trying to get an idea. It's already be tuned and ready to go. They just start strumming and you have it. Thanks to modern developments, the internet technology, communication technology, those traditional methods of um, trying to uh, popularize or to draw attention to a sound or what you are doing has been made it easier. I mean, you have various um, sites that cater to the needs of people trying to expose uh, new music. So the traditional ways of presenting music has dramatically changed thanks to things like MySpace and other sites dedicated to that purpose. The disadvantages, you have a saturation point where you have many people doing it and, um, and most of the time it's probably low quality. In some cases you find good quality ideas, but a, a lot of the things that you find on the on these sites, you, you can tell that it's unrefined, still underdeveloped ideas. That's a disadvantage, but the advantage is obviously emotion, awareness. So basically, the major label, or any label of any size, has been neutralized to a significant degree nowadays. I mean, you don't have to uh, ask EMI, or go to EMI, or go to Warner, or any other giant company to uh, make your uh, product public. You can do that pretty much yourself, and many people have done that successfully. Yes, that definitely has an economic um, impact because uh, sales of physical unit, units obviously decline, so that influences the economic situation of the producer. But um, to compensate for that, the uh, 
producer has to find other ways to uh, make economics come back to him, publishing and performances and this sort of thing. So there are ways to compensate for that loss in the, in the recorded sector. If you make this balance between art and um, financial necessities, you bring the two perspectives together and they coalesce, and I think, I think you won't have any problem not only between uh, the integrity of what you do and the realities of existence. We've had this discussion many times. Difficult for me to accept sometimes, but um, you have to accept it eventually. You'd be, you'd be forced to accept it. Well, the obvious benefit is the uh, complementary aspect of it, that two different points of view musically combining to form one idea. So it, it makes the musical perspective a little bit more diverse than from a single point of view. Because obviously you want to see things the way you see them. You can even have another person interjecting their perspective in it. So it's a little bit more diverse, basically. First, you look at the original, and then you look at points in the original that could use improvement. That's as simple as it can get. You see what can be improved. It's, it's more than a remix. It's more of an analysis. So you're analyzing the original, and you're finding out what can be enhanced, made better, stronger. Basically, it's an improvement process. You're not remixing the parts, literally. You are refining, should I say. But we're actually taking your perspective and applying it to someone else's perspective. It's a hybrid perspective. There's multiple ways. Uh, sometimes you can build on, the, on the, another person's idea. Sometimes they can build on your idea. Or sometimes you can have just the beginnings of an idea and they continue that idea until it's completed. Basically, it's a back and forth process until the idea is as perfect as possible. There's a lot of desperation in this area. It's a very difficult place to, to, to thrive in, economically, socially, despairing place. There is no myth. It's not much more to say about that. You are, you know, obviously influenced by, influenced by the things around you. If you were to grow up in another environment, maybe you would have, would have had a different perspective. But if you would have grown up in a similar environment to the one you're influencing, maybe the result could have been the same. So it, it, it depends on what is stimulating you. I, I think it's time that nature and modernization strike a balance. So, so nature and mankind can coexist as much as possible. Because uh, mankind, is, for the most part, always had an asymmetrical relationship with nature. You know, bringing certain species to extinction, destroying the environment, so for the sort of like pollution, greenhouse gases, etc. So there's, there's always been a, an imbalance between humans and, and nature. I think once you have been formed, you will carry that form or how, how do you feel what you do anywhere you go. In the formative times where you are developing, I think it's important. But after you reach a certain point, you, your philosophy is fully developed. You can go anywhere in the world and apply that same philosophy because th that has been internalized in you. I see a person from their childhood to their teen years are being formed. And once they reach a certain age in adulthood, they're pretty much fixed. They will apply this philosophy in anywhere in the world, in a life situation. It's a little bit more challenging because multiple things can go wrong you know, that you didn't anticipate. Instruments can crash. Uh, the sound quality of the system could damage what you try to do. There are multiple reasons. Obviously, you have more control in, in a studio environment. So it's a, very, it's a very unstable environment. You don't know what could possibly fail. Viewer, provider of content. It depends on the actual reaction of the person on the stage. If you get a positive reaction, it makes the situation more comfortable. And you can proceed pretty much with confidence. But if you get a more or less neutral or negative reaction, it kind of makes the whole atmosphere uninspired, I say. But uh, I think the sound quality in the, in the system played an important role on how people perceive what's being done live. So if, if it may sound great when, you, when you're developing in the studio, but when you take it to the um, actual live environment, the sound system may damage the whole set. So. So that's, this is why sometimes we have to readapt what we do to particular environments. We have to readapt, add more bass here or turn the sound down because the, the volumes of various tracks can, can change from environment to environment. We have to do a lot of readaptation. Re